What a difference 17 hours makes. Strong close, near the highs of the session, getting back 5,100. IWM on the precipice of another breakout above 205. Kaplui down 20 and a half handles. GDP at 830. Bunch of earning stocks to cover. Stop man due at 835. See if he has any bearish statistics for us. It's Wednesday, pre-market prep. Let's get fired up. Welcome to Benzinga's pre-market prep. This is a volatile puppy here. It's all about execution styles and strategies. All right. Good morning, traders and investors. We're down about 20 handles. Strong close. We've been weak, leaking overnight, just off the pre-market low of 63 and a quarter. Uh, the buck up 26 cents at 104.02. Uh, bonds up almost a half a point. We'll see how they move off the GDP. Maybe I forgot that at 8.30. Crude down 71 cents at 78.15. Gold in the red by 5.50, 20.38. Silver down 20 cents at 22.50. And Bitcoin, I'm looking at the futures. I'm looking at the six handle up $2,430 at $60,035. Let me bring in Triple D. Triple D, I guess we'll just talk. Uh, we got two themes today. One, I guess, would be the Bitcoin, and we got some short squeezes going on. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. That's the running Bitcoin. I mean, the Bitcoin run has been nothing short of incredible. I did add to my Bitcoin position, you know, that a couple of weeks ago. Actually, it was right when it was starting to look a little bit. If you look right before she broke out there, I added to it. Like going back. Yeah, you got it right there. I remember I said the little cup and handle I kind of liked. And I kind of just, you know, the thought process, Bitcoin, you know, is still going higher here. You can just feel it here. So here we are, Bitcoin up here again. I'm still holding. I haven't sold any of the Bitcoin there. So holding on, it's been a nice move. Right. And, uh, you know, I had to say to Aaron, I'm like, a catalyst fundamentals. And uh, he said, do you need uh, do you need fundamentals? Do you need catalysts? It's Bitcoin. Let, let's talk. Well, the halving is coming and people will talk about that. I'm not a Bitcoiner, but I'm, you know, obviously you got technicals there, but the reason, you know, with Bitcoin and why, you know, I was so negative Bitcoin five years ago and why, you know, in the last year and a half, and I've been holding Bitcoin for a while now, is I've said, it's just not going away. And the reason it was created was, you know, the printing of money. Well, the printing presses don't stop. And you know what? There's places in not only, you know, North America, but other countries that have very unstable currencies. I just think there's, I don't think we're going to ever transact in it, but I'm a, I'm a believer of the store of value here now, even though it's I've said it's nothingness, which it really is. But I mean, money is really nothingness, too. It's not backed by gold or anything off the gold standard here now. It's not going away. I don't like any of the other crypto stuff. I don't have any Ethereum or anything. I've said Ethereum maybe, but I've had it in the past. But I'm a Bitcoin fan. And I'm All right. Let, let's bring in AB here. AB making it to work uh, two days in a row. How you doing, AB? I'm good, Joel and Dennis. How you guys doing this morning? Good, We're good, good, good. We got a lot to talk about. Uh, yeah. The team Dennis mentioned, I guess, fake meat. We do, yeah. To, to infinity and beyond, really. I mean, so beyond meat reported earnings after the close yesterday. And I mean, looking at the chart, you'd expect that this was a blowout earnings report. It really wasn't. I mean, they no. missed EPS big. EPS came in at negative two bucks and 40 cents. They beat on revenue, though, around 74 million for $66 million estimates. So, I mean, this thing has a lot of short interest. Decent, yeah. I mean, like, not even real. I don't even know if you can call it decent earnings. I guess mixed because they beat on revenue, missed on EPS, but the stock just took off. Uh, looks like the short squeeze trade is back on. Yeah, that's it. And, you know, it maybe started with Carvana a couple, you know, not even like three, four days ago. You can see Carvana blasting off. Got Kara's deal. Dale Capital comes in. I think it's Kara's deal. It comes in with a negative commentary saying they're short the stock and it's going to come back in. Well, that's just blown up in their face unless they covered, you know, immediately, which who knows. Um, but stock trading up here, you know, substantially um, last night um, or, or yesterday and even last night. It's pulling back here with the overall market here today. But Carvana probably kickstarted this, but then you get the beyond me. It's like, holy cow, squeeze central here. People say, how do you know it's a short squeeze? Well, 
when you have a, a report that's pretty crappy and you have a short interest that high and then it just starts going and going and going. Stocks don't just go up 100% on crappy reports. They go up because it's just too much short interest in here and you squeeze them. And that's what's happening here. So the squeeze trade is back on. So if you're short any of these meme stocks, I'd be careful here. When you're starting to see this stuff, it's time to not be short these things. So you've got you know two stocks now, Carvana Beyond Me, that have really blasted off. So I'd be cautious being short any of these small stocks. I'm long a few of them in my trading account, not Beyond Me or Carvana. But I've been you know just dabbling here because I expect the short squeeze trade to maybe you know continue here. Now today's you know sell off here. Maybe that puts a little damper in it because last night a lot of those stocks were already popping. I know AMC, no position in AMC. Uh, was popping over five bucks last night and it's going to report here tonight and it's obviously one of the memester stocks there too or an ape stock i guess there's a difference um so i don't know what do you think joel like usual yeah. one thing to say i'll just put it on context and i'll wrap up my okay. point is usually when you see all the trash they're rallying it usually indicates a short-term top in the market so that would make me more cautious in some of the mega cap stuff here right now because it's like mania starting speculation getting rampant uh, i'm a little bit cautious on the overall yeah. market for that. oh boy i mean you're talking about you know if you're short you know going in first of all going short into these reports i mean you know what what do you have i mean yesterday you had seven points of downside right eight points of downside and what was your risk on the upside unlimited right so yeah. tough going in short uh I guess it's a mixed bag here for Beyond Me shareholders because we traded up to fifteen fifty. That is fifteen fifty is where we traded These up go to. Crazy when they start that's going. That's crazy. crazy. I mean, that's like a, that's like a six months move in the thing. Yeah. Uh, I will just man when I when I see stuff like this, I try to find something on the dailies that says, "Hey, you know, if I was a, just a regular old day trader." And I'd say, man, if this thing gets up to 13 bucks today, uh, between 13 and 13.40, I saw multiple highs in that area. Then you get into the gap area. So I'll give that. Coming back on the downside, I have absolutely no idea where to buy this thing. And, you know, just say, I mean, we tried it. We had it for a while. And now, I mean, who actually, eat? I mean, it's not that good. Dennis, do you want to tell the story about when your kid, when you gave him a Beyond Meat Burger? Yeah, well, that was when Spencer was four, so it's a number of years ago, and Spencer's nine now, so we're going back to five years when the Beyond Meat was hot, and, you know, it was the talk of the town, and I remember, like, I cooked a bunch of them on the barbecue, we all did Beyond Meat burgers there, and I put it on, the, you know, the bun, I didn't say anything to the kid, and, you know, he likes a good hamburger, and he's four years old, and he bites into the hamburger, and then he just sits it back down. He takes the patty off the hamburger, and then he proceeds <laughs> to eat the ketchup and the and the lettuce and the tomato on he, it and he didn't no even meat. know he didn't so even he know. wasn't a fan he knew oh he, i don't mind him i think it tastes actually didn't pretty tell good him, you didn't tell him ahead of time though I'm nothing saying. nothing nothing he, he just figured just it out to see. The first bite, he knew yeah. right away he's like he just didn't even say anything he just took it off he's like nope so he knew but i i honestly think they taste pretty good so i just don't like the price like you go to the grocery store and like they're in canada and like two of these patties are like eight bucks i'm like it's just really expensive so that's why I'm not a fan of it. It's just the price. But I don't mind the taste. I don't know how much better it is for you either, though. Like, you know, like you look, there's lots of fat in there still. It's not like this is a healthy burger. Sure, there maybe there's no cow in there, so it helps the planet a little bit. But I don't know if it helps my heart at all. I don't know if it's maybe it's a little bit better than a normal burger. But I don't just don't know if it's done. But that's the beyond me. You know, we've talked this, you know before none of that matters when you get into a short squeeze situation none of it matters i mean the story here is still over folks it's just a matter of you know stocks don't go straight to zero you know it was 239 dollars never coming back to there i'm gonna say on the show it's never people never going back to 239 dollars gonna go to 15 or 20 on a squeeze maybe but i think if you just got 750 to 15 on a short squeeze i'd ring the register if i was in it well, another sector that's been getting beat up recently has been the solar sector. Uh, we had first solar report last night as well. And actually a, sh a shining bright spot in the solar space. Uh, uh, f first solar reported EPS of $3.25 came in versus $3.18 estimates. So you had an EPS beat there. Revenue missed 
by about 160 million. So I was kind of surprised to see the stock trading up so much. I mean, that's a pretty decent a revenue eight. miss of about like yeah. 10% revenue came yeah. in at just above a billion dollars uh, for first solar. And, and they gave decent guidance. And again, I think this is probably just because solar names have been getting so beat up that this decent report is now sending it higher. I think so too. Low bar here. First Solar has proven that they are best in breed here now. A lot of people gave that title to ENPH back in 2021 because, like, look, First Solar goes nowhere. ENPH from 50 to 350. Well, ENPH is back down here at 121. Everybody hates the stock here now. So, First Solar back to having, you know, they were always the number one until 2021 when all the other ones went. Now they seem to have the title here again. Again, these are interest rate sensitive stocks. So you get the pop here, but I don't see them cutting rates tomorrow. So I don't know if we're just going to blast off from 155 to 185 to 200. I don't know if I see the gap and go here. What do you think, Joel? Man, uh, just coming up on some minor daily resistance. So if you, I'll just give you some daily targets here. Uh, and you're very close to one right now. Uh, 155.95 was your fe February 20th high. And then things open up to 159.44. But if you're buying this thing off the open, you just want to see bids. You know, you don't, you don't want to see it like open up and then take down 50 cents on you. If you do, I mean, people are taking profits, maybe people a little anticipatory buying into the report, which is kind of lazy. They're taking a shot just because it was a beat up stock and, you know, going with the theme. I don't think it's that heavily uh, shorted. Which one already reported and got the pop? Was that? Yeah. Um, so, so a, a ENPH of, yeah. and SEDG then reported, and it got an initial pop and then dropped. Yeah. And none of those earnings were great. Yeah. So I mean, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but, you know, let's see if uh, you get a little bit of a topping pattern. That's certainly what you had with the two other peers um, in the sector. I mean, it got nearly to 140 for ENPH, and if you chased it, you'd be looking down here at uh, the $121 area. Big haircut in about eight sessions. Well, if you're if you're up on, uh, you know, first solar, maybe you're looking for a little insurance and a different – uh, insurance or an insurance company that reported earnings last night, Lemonade, not so great. Uh, EPS beat negative 61 cents versus negative 80 cent estimates. Uh, slight revenue miss, but I mean, this one's getting beat up, and this one, uh, I, I mean. I don't know what you do if you're in Lemonade because it's just not been getting any love really for the past. What Except is for the last two days when it went from yeah. 10 to 22 ahead of the report. And <laughs> here is the strategy once again, the strategy I talk about for years and years and years. Owning stocks ahead of reports and then selling them right before they report. Two days before you buy LMND, you know, even a week before, boom, 18 to 22, you had your money. Take your money and run. You know, the stock ran up 15% ahead of the report. So that's what you see happening a lot this earnings season. They're running ahead of the reports, and then the bar is a little higher, and then they're not continuing. Some of them continue after, but earnings is always a crapshoot. When you take a stock through earnings, it's often a coin flip. So, you know, if you're a trader, trade them ahead of it, but don't take them through. That's kind of the way I play for the most part. Sometimes I get an inkling. Sometimes I get some gut. Sometimes they get a small piece if I feel like it's going to be okay. But for the most part, as a trading perspective, own them before, not after. Well, wow, Street leaning the wrong way into this report. Pain being inflicted by people that did hold it on to the report. Uh, on the other hand, if you shorted it, it's a little bit of a, a saving grace here. I'm just going to look at the two-day low. We did trade below it uh, in the regular uh, in the uh, pre-market session. So 18 bucks. I just call that minor support because you only had one daily low. Uh, but if you want to be a little bit more patient in this one. Uh, maybe wait to the 17, the lower 17s. I see three, four uh, lows in that area uh, to get back to the bottom of yesterday's range. You need to go up to uh, 20 bucks. So uh, no short squeeze in lemonade. And no short squeeze in Urban Outfitters so far. Down 10% after uh, Urban reported earnings last night. Uh, EPS came in at around 69 cents, missed by five cents, and revenue came in at 1.49 billion, missed by 10 million. So double miss, but very, very, you know, slight miss there. Uh, and you're still seeing this stock get beat up uh, this morning again, down about 10%. This 
air is coming a little bit out of the moment. Yeah, right? it is. I'd be yeah, careful yeah. chasing the momentum stocks of the first eight weeks of the year here. So, you know, obviously, you know, we've talked in video a lot of times, but Lily looks tired to me, sold off a bit yesterday, did bounce back, and maybe it starts to make a new high. You know, Urban had run, 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 run into the report. We know Urban and ANF are the two stocks that just seem to, you know, just oh. go up no matter what. Um, and they've been running. I mean, bar is high here. Bar is high. And again, you know, interest rate cuts are coming, but they may not be coming tomorrow. And some of these stocks, the momentum stocks, have just been running and running and running. I don't like it when I see these stocks squeezing these other ones here, too. It's just making me think there's too much speculation. Usually what happens, you get two, three days of squeezes, and the whole bloody market sells off. So the, the short squeezes on the other stocks making me nervous on everything. Urban trading action is not what you want to see, not bouncing back here. Maybe it does. Maybe, you know, they just come in and buy the dip. It is a strong stock. You want to buy strong stocks on dips. Uh, but I just don't like the air coming out a little bit of the Momo trade. Ah, uh, boy, oh, boy. Did they report pizza sales? Um, No, I'm not seeing any pizza sales on my Benzinga Pro. <laughs> that that it, that, that's an old joke from they got into pizza a couple of years, like 12, 13 years ago or something that like that. Well. I, Urban, never never found out. Yeah, yeah, they tried to uh, do some research. I'm probably the only one that remembers it. Oh, man. Uh, that down 458, man, if you didn't take profits into this uh, in this report, you're scratching your head. Uh, boom, you did trade under $42. You went to 4150 uh, in the pre-market. Now, I'm looking here uh, on the left. I do see three lows in that area. So if it did come back down, not one, not two, but three lows just for today, if you came down there, I'd perhaps look for a little bit of a bounce. Uh, below that, it opens up to the $40 area. I just want to take a look at uh, Geo. I don't know if Geo has been in the chat before or been listening to the show. Geo, welcome. Uh, he's short Abercrombie and Fitch up here. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm not sure what technical indicator uh, you're using, but uh, looking at this chart, I guess if you stop yourself out at the old time high, 127.69, you're doing okay. But what I'd be focusing on, Geo, is that two day old time closing high, 126.21. A lot of times I like to keep the mark. So if you get a rally up to that area today, maybe, you know, hold on. Uh, but that was the old time closing high for A and F. What an and you incredible would think run. And you would think A and F would sell off with Urban U R B N. Um, it's not selling off much, but it is down here. I would have thought it would sell off more with this. So keep an eye. I mean, if it doesn't respond, what you want to see today is you want to see the air come out of Urban or A and F, especially if Urban stays down. You don't want to see Abercrombie Fish turn around and start going green. So just you know, be cautious whenever you're shorting rocket ship stocks, and we definitely are shorting a rocket. Definitely, <laughs> you're definitely shorting a rocket ship stock here. It's just going straight up, not rocket ship like you know, blast off like SMCI. But it's been going straight up. You're you're fighting the trend for sure. Trend reversal trades are very difficult to time. But if yes, you're trying to time one, today is the day <laughs> for that. So Abercrombie would expect to be down on Urban. You want to see them come in and continue to sell it. I have no trade on this. Yeah, and Jay pointed out that uh, Decker and Elf are also two retail yeah. stocks that are trading basically at or at all time highs. So if yeah. you're if you're looking for the wind to come out of the retail trade, then you know those are other names that are right at the highs that could also. Uh, again, if people are selling all retail names based on Urban's uh, earnings, which it doesn't look like that's happening yet, but you could see some of that momentum come out. Uh, again, Decker and Elf are two other stocks that are, are at all-time highs. And the SMCI is just not, you know, we're talking the ultimate Momo trade. Obviously, you know, I'm still out of it. People keep asking, are you rebuying on this pullback? It looks tired to me too here still. Like you, what you had was the vicious sell-off, the reversal, which was going to happen. And then the snapback, and the snapback was so vicious as well, from 700 to 1,000 in two days, just like that. But then we put the little double top in there, kind of failed there again, didn't make a new high on the move. So now you start thinking, if you breach 800, 800 is going to be your first support level. But if you breach 800 SMCI, then you start thinking about the low of the move again down at 692. So I'm not, I think you're okay if you're long this as long as it's above 800. If it loses 800 here SMCI, yeah, I'd be very yeah. cautious. And if you want to play it closer to, uh, you know, give yourself a little bit more room. I mean, I know 800, there's not much there, but 700 was the dot, you know, uh, the big whoosh down on the, that second day. 
So 800, one level, uh, but 700 to the next one. I think under 700, you really opens up to the I mean, it always opens up the downside everywhere. Let's just take a look at NVIDIA. I've been, I haven't been trading NVIDIA, but I've been keeping it on my screen more. And I, it's just like, you, you know, you look for that catalyst stock for the day. And like the other day, like the focus stock was Berkshire Hathaway, right? I mean, that big open, totally, you talk about a capitulation or a key reversal. I've been keeping his eye on NVIDIA too. And and what I noticed is that a lot of times when like the S&P, you know, the S&Ps have like, you know, had a nice pop, it's had a nice pop too, but it just seems like there's patient sellers out there, you know, like trying to sell into a little bit of a strength. I mean, if you're holding on to this thing, I really don't think until you get into that gap area, which we're getting close to, uh, that gap low day was 742.40. Those were things really open up on the downside here. That gap all the way down to 688.88 from that blowout earnings report. Yeah, and we were talking about the momentum coming out of some of these names, Lily and and whatnot, where moment there where there still is momentum, and we talked about Bitcoin. Some of these Bitcoin stocks, I mean, looking at Coinbase, Mara, so gone. Uh, I mean, these things look like nothing, no wins coming out of these sales over here, but Coinbase. Uh, it is now at its like I trading at its highest point since May yeah. 2022. So when you're looking at almost two whole years, uh, or, or like Coinbase's first high in two years. Kathy Wood was actually selling this last week. It's still her biggest holding, but I mean, she offloaded a lot of shares basically into this <laughs> strength. And it's like, I mean, not not to pick on anyone, but it's like, I guess when you're cold, you're cold, and it seems like she she can't really win right now. Whatever whatever she does, she buys something that goes down, she sells something that goes up. I think you she has a lot careful. though. She yeah. still has a lot. It's more than 10% of her. She owns more than 2% of Coinbase. So yeah, I don't want to like, it's not like she sold a lot of it, but she was selling, I think like 100,000 shares last week. I think you got to be very careful chasing it at this point. I mean, it's up another 10 bucks here, 209. But nothing goes straight up. Remember that, folks. You know, if you're chasing and and I, I, the story to tell, you know, and I haven't told that one in a while, is the when I started break trading, I've told you this, Joel, but you remember, the kid sitting beside me. When I started break trading in May of 1999, I was a young buck, 22 years old, just you know, just trying to figure out the markets. And I learned from him what not to do all the time. He chased everything. So I can start going, I'm buying it. Oh, that's good. Like be going, going, going left, like you know, like like crazy. Oh, I'm buying that. And then we'd turn around and sell off him. And he's caught and he's trying to get out. And then it would be the same thing, chasing everything. Man, do not jump on a moving train. Chasing sometimes works, but most of the time it does not. We just ran from Coinbase from 170 to 210 in two days. It's up 20 some percent in two days that is chasing folks if you're buying bitcoin now if you're buying coinbase now if you're buying mara now you are chasing more often than not not 100 percent of the time nothing is ever 100 percent of the time but more often than not if you're chasing stocks you usually get burned i bet you she sells some more today that's just a hunch. I mean, she I sells know, into strength. She's the yeah. ultimate little contrarian too. She's a contrarian trader. She buys into weakness and sells into strength. You know, and, and again, you know, in some cases, then that's a good thing to do. But the problem is she adds to losers just so much. Like she adds and adds and adds. And when her thesis is wrong, we know she really gets burned. And I mean, we, we talk, Kathy, we don't talk her very much anymore. And it's difficult because... You know, she's just become irrelevant. Uh, you know, Mark Chaikin said that two years ago. She's becoming irrelevant, and she absolutely has. So, I mean, it's $51. The ARC, it's fun to day trade every once in a while. It's got good liquidity. But, I mean, you know, she hasn't – our ARKK in the last six years is flat, Joel. In six years, we've had one of the best bull markets in tech that we have ever seen. In six years, the QQQs have went from 165 to 437. That's the market. That's just buying tech stocks, the overall market. In that same time period, her stock, her ETF is flat. She may be the worst tech investor out there. Who can't make money being long tech stocks in the last six years? Keep putting money with her, folks, if you did want, but she is not a good investor. Yeah, well, uh, we'll see if Coinbase continues to catch a bid today. Uh, speaking of bids, 
eBay reported yesterday after the close as well. And some strong numbers for eBay. Let me go ahead and pull those up real quick while you get the chart up. Uh, eBay looks, so we had uh, EPS came in at a buck, $1.07, beat by four cents. Revenue came in at $2.56 billion, beat by $50 million. I'm actually kind of surprised by that. I wouldn't have guessed that eBay still does $2.5 billion of revenue in a quarter. That's a, that's a lot of money. Again, we're having a little bit of a turn here where value is perking up and eBay, I would throw in as a value stock. And, you know, some of the momentum is starting to slow in other things. You can clearly see in the IWM having a pretty good day yesterday. QQQ is flat. So you're starting to see a little bit of rotation to names that haven't participated. eBay has not participated, so it's one of those names um, that, you know, maybe set up well into earnings. And you're getting a nice pop here. Do I want to say eBay is the next big thing and throw it in my long-term portfolio? I'm going to invest rah, rah, rah. I don't know. Valuation has been attractive in eBay for a while and it's been a dog. But right now, value is a little bit more in favor. So I'm more inclined to trade those stocks from the long side if that value trade is going to continue to be. But I'm not chasing. Again, I'm not chasing some up $2.40. Wow, this spiked to forty-eight twenty-one. How did it get through that gap? I was just looking to see if uh, I thought the pre-market high was just under 47. No, 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 no. They took this to 48.21. That filled the gap that you had at 48.11. Man, I, I don't know if it gets back up here. If you can see it all the way on my uh, upper right chart, that's where the gap is, right? There was nothing in there on the way down. There was nothing there on the way up. So that's a that's a solid target for today and also moving forward. You get into that and things open up. But uh, boy, oh boy, sometimes just look at it like simple things like a gap fill. I mean, maybe it's going to go a lot higher in 48 today, but you're looking uh, you're looking OK. If you got, you know, got it, that gap fill of 48, 46, 70. Uh, where to buy this thing? Uh, top of yesterday's range, potentially buy this thing that comes in at. 44.79 the monthly looks kind of interest uh interesting as well if you go to my bottom right chart you've been laboring at 44 and a half 45 exactly actually what i said on the uh closing print with christian from Hertz yesterday was if this thing blows through 45 you better get the hell out of the way on the short side just because of how it's been contained under 45 since august of 2023 value stocks are a little back in favor so I don't think this is one that I'm necessarily shorting either. Mm -hmm. If I can't do anything else on this show, I one thing maybe I can do is is help bring some insights into how young people use some of these companies. And I don't hear too much about people using eBay, but the one thing that I do hear people using eBay for is buying like vintage clothes. So people will look for like a you know 1990s Patagonia ski jacket on eBay. But I don't know how many. I mean, people are doing that because it's cheap because you can find one for like fifty bucks. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I guess like, where's all the all the volume coming from eBay? I thought Amazon was just dominating the e-commerce spot. Do you guys buy anything off eBay anymore? I don't anymore. I never really did. Well, though. I mean, I did. I, I, I used eBay like 10, 15 years ago, like before, like when it was bigger than Amazon, like on, on the e-commerce side. And now it's, you know, I mean, I don't know. But um, do I gotta go wide sure. here? Do I gotta uh, go oh wide yeah, yeah, here? yeah! Oh we boy, GDP, come on! We got, we got GDP in All two right. wide. GDP in two minutes. Trust anything. Uh, the expectation. Let me go ahead and pull that up real quick. So we're looking for three point three percent, and this is just the first revision. So uh, we'll get those numbers for you coming okay. out in one minute. And yeah, Dennis might go wide, so it might just I'm be Joel and I. And then in five minutes. Back. In five minutes, we'll be joined by Ryan Dietrich from Carson Group. Uh, Ryan's always a great guest, so excited to see what types of charts and stats he has for us today. By the way, you do more than one good thing for the show, uh, besides right. giving us a perspective for, from young people. Um, I can't think of it right now, but I know okay. it's more than one. <laughs> All right. 60, 63 and a quarter. That's your pre-market low. That's right near a good weekly number. I, I told myself I would not get super bearish until we took out 50, 60, 63 and a quarter is your pre-market low. We've had about a 30-point range. Actually, we've had a 28-point range. 14 off that that would take you back to the 77 78 area 
really not much there um, as far as resistance. Yesterday's low is at 67. We're still above that. So uh, not much in here. Technically, if we get anywhere near unchanged on this, uh, you'll see some offers out there. Go wide means has been in offers. All right. Our our GDP for Q4 came in at 3.2% versus 3.3%. It was 4.9%. Prior, so this is going lower the GDP and lower than estimates. I don't know if that's good or bad for the market because you know if it, if it's lower, then you might be okay. We're closer to rate cuts. If it's higher, then okay, the economy's still good. So uh, let's see how. I mean, w Joel, what are we that doing? This? Nothing. Of Dennis of is back. <laughs> we, did we move one point? <laughs> I got the chart up. We had a spike down. Well, we're rallying now. We spike down to seventy. And now we're at 74. I know, I know, Dennis. You like to you like to see more action than that. Um, all I would say is that if it's a little bit weaker, or whatever, that's good because interest rates are coming down, right? Or if it's not super hot, that means the whole interest rate scenario, which I don't think anything are they're going anywhere. But uh, there we go. Uh, bonds getting a little getting a little bit of a movement now here, but still really, uh, really in no man's land. Still down 16 and a quarter handles. Quiet, yeah, there's quite quiet. Uh, there was a uh, PCE prices came in at 1.8 percent versus 1.7 percent estimate, uh, so slightly higher on PCE prices. But I think we're going to get more PCE data tomorrow, uh, which the market should care about more. But I mean, yeah, either way, the market's not really moving much off this, and this was just a GDP revision, um, and it basically came in in line. So maybe that's why. Oh, looks like a little pop there, Joel. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we're 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 moving a lighter number. We're going up uh, mid range on the sessions right here at seventy eight. I think you're still in price discovery here, but it's not like a rocket ship, you know. It's not like we when we've had some weak numbers. Well, it could oh, be no, a little uh -oh. bit of a rocket uh -oh. ship. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, they're liking this Man, number. I gotta I, go remove myself again. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you. Had, that's all you had to say to get the market moving, Joel. Is that it's not a rocket ship, and then there it goes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but speak, we'll, we'll continue watching this, see how SPY is trading. But speaking of rocket ships, one stock we didn't get to in mentioning the short squeezes is Carvana. And I mean, this thing has now gone from at $4 at one point last year, I want to say, 4 or 5 bucks to $80 yesterday. Yeah. This thing just continues to run. And Carvana, you would think, would be one of those companies that people are looking at like, oh, they need lower interest rates. So that way people are buying more cars and stuff. But Clearly not. They don't need interest rates to go lower when the stock's going from five bucks to 80. Yeah. Now, this was the one that I felt like was the catalyst for the start of the short squeeze, which we, we did mention just off the bat. From 50, obviously on earnings report, it had the big gap up, but then it's continued here. And this is a squeeze stock. This is a squeeze happening. The earnings were good. Those earnings were actually pretty decent. Uh, but you know, they were probably, you know, overbought here because there's a short interest in here as well. And everybody who's short the thing is like, oh crap. So it's continued. I mean, it's pulling back a little bit here this morning, but I mean, we're in breakout mode here in Carvana. Keep that one on your sc screen. Beyond me too, as if you're trading these squeeze stocks, you want to see these things continue to go higher. You don't want to see them give it back. And I mean, when this thing got down to four or five dollars, it was like the most hated stock in the market. People thought it was going out of business, and it almost—I mean, I don't want to say it's like GameStop esque, but I mean, it's it's similar in the sense that it was so shorted, people were sure it's going out of business. And then, like, I guess some investors looking at it were like, "Oh no, there's some underlying value here." And I mean, uh, uh, I don't even know what percentage move that is from four or five dollars to eighty, but that's a that's a pretty that's big, a pretty move. impressive. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you're going to be able to nineteen hundred percent. How'd I do? I'm guessing. Ah, uh, yeah. Someone else. I think I'm so, probably in the ballpark. Someone in the in the chat that's better at math than us, help us out. I think I'm way. close. That was my error math. Look at those error math skills. I bet you I'm close. But what's crazy? Five, oh, yeah, really good. Five eighty. Yeah. Five yeah. eighty sounds like nineteen hundred percent to me. Well, yeah, because what you did is you did eighty divided by four, and that was you know that would be two thousand. It was just yeah, under that. Good. Very good, Dennis. Holy macro! Math. You are a bot. Dennis math is champion. a bot. He math is a math champion. bot. I won't go into my math stories from third grade and the multiplication. Well, yeah, when you beat I'm, who was it you beat again? Who was the girl? Uh well, the the oh, first test. No, what happened was is the first test that they did. You had to do a bunch of them in under thirty seconds, and it was only me, me and this other girl, Peggy Bratcher. Hope she's Peggy, not listening. Peggy, that's and funny. I was like. And I'm like, there's no way. I went up to the teacher. I'm like, there's no way she got everything right. Okay. And the teacher went and looked under her desk. 
and like she had the answers written down. She was cheating. She cheated. And you she snitched cheated. on and you snitched on her, Joel. I did. Let's go on to win. I, 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 I wanted to be the only winner. I uh, wanted to be the only winner. All right, eight thirty-five. We've got our man was... Ryan Dietrich hanging out backstage from the Carson Group. Let's go ahead and bring Ryan on. All right, Ryan Dietrich, Chief Market Strategist at the Carson Group, better known on this show as Stat Man Do, and he is going to give us some negative statistics today. <laughs> Joel, I'm not going to upset you. I can't believe what you did to Peggy all those years ago. That's unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, hey, that's Joel. But I, I've been yeah. listening, and Ryan has been a little bit cautious in the last couple of weeks here. He has getting a little bit cautious. Are you still got the cautious vibe going here? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, I might have a record number of charts. I'll dip into that here in a second. Go, give us your uh, – he always comes with a full presentation. We might as well yeah, let the stats yeah. take over. I talk Let's fast. sit back I'll talk, and I'll enjoy the stats. Popcorn. There, there's a lot. Popcorn. popcorn. Yeah, popcorn. Yeah, just big picture, you know, we have been bullish. And yes, there are some reasons to think we could have a little bit of a normal pullback here, 5% maybe. I mean, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, but just big picture, guys, we are still pretty darn bullish. I mean, let me share my screen here. Let's see if I can get this to work. Hey, guys, second time I've talked this year. I talked like the first week of January. How's everybody doing? Everybody doing all right? Good. Good. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying. I mean, you're one of our once a monthers. So, uh, you know, if you're not traveling or, you know, uh, firing me, oh, I see him on CNBC you. like every day. Yeah, so well, I feel yeah. like I'm still connected to him. So. He has to do <laughs> those secondary bar. Yeah, those I was podcasts. in New York. I was in New York last week and did the compound friends with Josh and Batnick, and that was amazing. I mean, that that's like fifty thousand downloads on the on the their YouTube channel and promoting too much, but that was that was pretty cool. So that that was a, that was a neat one. But let's um let's dive in. I think I've shared this chart with you guys every time for two years now, so I'll just keep doing it. You know, it's the presidential cycle based on the quarter quarterly breakdown. And it's really worked well to keep it simple, right? The fourth quarter of a pre-election year, first half of a uh, I'm sorry. The fourth quarter of a midterm year, apologies, is usually strong. That was first half of a pre-election year. Check that. Third quarter, you get a little weak this pre-election year. Check that. Fourth quarter. Now, I will say we're deviating a little bit, obviously, with this really strong first quarter of an election year. So just something to think about here. And also, you know, February is usually weak. Well, we'll see. February's almost over. I know we got an extra day this this time, um, but it hasn't been weak yet, so that's got my attention. Nonetheless, you know, it wouldn't be shocking the first half of an election year, just looking at history to see a little weakness. It's usually later in an election year when you get that strength. Now, here's a fun one. Don't invest in this, but horned animals, it turns out, you know, hey, horns. Horns are bullish, okay? Makes sense. Now, this is the Chinese Zodiac. We just started Year of the Dragon. You can see dragons have horns. Last I checked, goats and oxes are bullish. You got roosters snakes and rats not that bullish of course this is a goofy one it's a silly one kind of put it with the super bowl indicator but i just thought it was interesting guys that horned animals historically do better wow. for the stock market you're the dragon but let's get a little more serious so so goes january goes year and i've got some up january up february stuff coming up very soon this is, this is a big one yes i mean believe me this is this is this stuff is like random, I guess, kind of, but it sure seems to work more often than not. Uh, you know, we had a five or six percent January last year in 2023. Came on you then, said, hey, when you're up a lot in January, you tend to be up a lot for the year. Check mark that. This time we gained, I don't know what, one and a half, two percent or so, but it was a positive Jan. It is what it is. You see here, when you're up in January, up 17 percent for the year, pretty solid. When you're down in January, that weakness kind of tends to continue. So let's just have that have that in the back of our heads there. But the big one, I'm assuming here we're going to be up in February. I don't think it's too crazy of a bet with two days to go. I know futures are a tad lower now, but we'll see. Um, it, it, so let's see here. So usually this is what happens when you're up those first two months. So what I think is fascinating, 12 months later, guys, up 27 out of 28 times. I mean, wow. it, one of those, it is what it is. I mean, that, that's when you're up January and February, starting on March 1st. You're higher a year later, 27 out of 28 times. The next 10 months, so we'll call it the rest of the year, higher 
26 out of 28 times. And you see the returns, they're really strong returns, especially versus the average year return. So just these things that we've been over at equity since December 22. Come on with you monthly, honestly. Thank you for keep having me back. Talking about why we're still overweight. Maybe we get a break, sure. But I mean, we still would use them as an opportunity. We still think we're in a bull market here. And I'll talk about the F word here in a little bit. Fundamentals as well, but I'm just doing some of the technical stuff first. Um, so what do we have here? Okay, this is just what it looks like if you're up January and February up 19.9% on average, right? We're up, what, 6 or 7%, give or take, this year. So your average year, we're getting close to darn near 20. We're not expecting a 20% rally uh, this year. We're more in the 11 to 13%, so call that around 4,300, 4,400. Nonetheless, we wouldn't complain because we are overweight equities with the models that we run, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll adjust as we go forward. But just something to think about. Uh, what do we have here? Oh, when you're up November, December, January and February, like we will be right now, 14 times the full calendar year. So that'd be 2024. Uh, has been higher 14 out of 14 times. You see it on your screen. They're up 17% on average. So, um, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. It's 21%. Apologies on the left there. It's calendar year up 21% on average, never lower when these recent four months are higher. Again, just something to think about and stack on that, that bullish uh, pyramid that we continue to grow on. Now, here, uh, you, you mentioned, Dennis, you know, some things that potentially little little banana peel. Well, it's a first-term president of an election year. Election year is usually a little dicey from here until Ides of March, especially under a first-term president. So this by itself is no reason to wildly be bearish. I'm just pointing out the fact that seasonality has worked pretty darn well. Right about now, for the next three weeks or so, you tend to have a little bit of banana peel with a first-term president. Just something to think Think about if we had some weakness. I shared this last year as the Carson composite. I take a bunch of years and stick them together. It worked really well last year. So this one, the average year, this for the S&P, average year, past 20 years, year four of a, president, a presidential cycle, year four of a new president, and then after a 20% gain. What happens? Well, again, you can see kind of where we are now, some weakness, some chop into late April would be perfectly normal when you take a bunch of years and smush them together to find a year kind of like this one shared this with you before we know pre-elect pre-election years are usually pretty strong in our first term president we knew that a year ago talked about it a year ago 20 percent of the average that checked out but you're up about 12.2 percent under a first term president or what do you even call it president up free election and you're negative when you have a lame duck president so that's just stuff to think about now here's the numbers there's your last 10 presidents in a first term what happened during the election year it was higher every time, up 12.2% average. It's kind of right in that range of where we wouldn't be shocked if markets kind of finished up this year with low double-digit returns. Honestly, the way things are going might be a little higher, but that's kind of where we came into this year. Just a few more. The MAG-7 in a bubble, I could spend 30 minutes talking about this. It's Yes, there's some bubblicious flavor to some of those names, but this is looking at the last two years or 20, 24 months. And the green is earnings growth. Now, what I'll wow. you know, the earnings growth has been unbelievable. I mean, just look at the video, right? There's been a multiple compression the last 26 months on the video. Stock's cheaper than it was 26 months ago. That's unbelievable. I mean, that's incredible. Profit was up over 900 or almost 900% last year. So listen, these stocks are really stretched. We're more neutral tech and we like industrials, financials. We get into this stuff. Small caps, mid caps, we like those areas. We wouldn't be shocked if it came out of the MAG7 a little bit, but I've been seeing people say MAG7 in a bubble. Listen. Maybe it's a little bubblicious, but there are wild earnings and these MAG7 names. You can see here, the green means earnings, okay? A lot of the growth these stocks have seen in the last two years have indeed come from earnings, which is a little different than the late 90s. I love this one because it upsets people. I love upsetting people. What can I say? Um, <laughs> the consumer is actually in some of the best shape we've seen in decades. Only a couple more charts, I swear. But this is, look, uh, what what is um, net wealth? Well, Assets minus liabilities, whatever's left, let's just call that net wealth. So, but you need to normalize it, right? You can't just say, well, there's a lot of debt out there, there's a lot of equity out there. We normalize it in this particular chart by disposable income, right? If you got a lot of debt, how are you going to service that? How are you going to pay it? Well, disposable income, okay? And disposable income was up uh, 133 trillion last year. Or I'm sorry, <laughs> that'd be way more. 1.33 trillion last year. That's a lot for disposable income. What, what, what does this matter to someone listening right now? Look at the red. That's liabilities as a percent of disposable income running at about 100% right now. That was 98% uh, 
in the late 90s. So yes, we have a lot of debt in this country, but you have to normalize it when we do it by disposable income. You would you could argue debt's about the same as it's been for the last 25 years, but look at the assets part of things as we know stocks and bonds and housing and all that stuff, homes have gone up a lot. So I would make the argument the consumer is in a lot better shape than they tell us when we look at TV. We'll skip that one. Uh, this is one that just, I always hear, well, it's all about the 1%, all about the 1%. You know, there was a study from the Fed not too long ago that said ages between 19 and 38 gained about 80% net wealth since, I think it was since 2020, so, or no, maybe it's 2019. But nonetheless, they've gained a lot more in net wealth. Why is that? Well, as a percent, they've owned more stocks lately, and stocks have done well, so that's kind of good. But this breaks things down by the income percentiles. It's it's um, uh, liabilities as a percent of assets. You want this to go down. Okay, You want this to be going down. It means you have less liabilities as much as you're worth. Well, just check it out. Various income classes are doing well. We're not naive. We understand there are people struggling and there are some issues. There are some major issues that are out there. But I think when we hear the consumer, it's not all about just the top 1% anymore. I mean, there have been some major, major advances in income and in incomes and net wealth for lower um, income uh, people. And I think that's a really powerful thing. We'll skip that one. I love talking about inflation. Don't come on to you for a while. Showing this one on the left, it's um the private data, apartment list, negative year over year, eight months in a row. Yes, CPI and PCE, little stubborn. But if you look at core CPI, it's 44% of shelter. If you take that out, and let's be honest, most people own their house. Most people own 60% of people own a house. Most people, 80% of them are locked in at less than 3.5%. So is this housing inflation we're seeing with shelter up like 6.5%, 7% really impacting most people? We would say absolutely not. And then on the right, we, say, we show uh, uh, CPI the last three months annualized at 1.8 percent okay but look at the bottom take out shelter uh, again we think shelter is going to come back inflation in our opinion was last year's problem uh what is that annualized 1.1 percent uh, if you take out shelter so again maybe the fed doesn't necessarily have to start cutting right now but we're hearing the fed's going to hike the fed's going to hike we'd say no the fed's no. not going to hike we still right, think there's right, a right. chance, right? To quote uh, Lloyd Christmas, you tell me there's a chance. We could see a cut in May, but nonetheless, um, this is a powerful. I think about the last thing I want to talk about that we can chat. I've come on before saying productivity is the whole key to this whole thing. Eight million jobs created the last two years. The eight, the cycle of employment is aging, okay? I mean, that's fine. You can't make 300, 400,000 jobs every month. But we are seeing a renaissance in productivity in our country. 3.9% annualized the last three quarters. What in the world does that mean? History going to repeat itself. It often rhymes, Mark Twain. In the mid-90s, we saw uh, wages about 4 to 5%, inflation about 2.5%. That sound kind of familiar? It's kind of like right now. Greenspan saw the internet and saw different things taking place with productivity. That He said, you know what? I can cut right now, and it's not going to cause massive inflation. Because when you have higher productivity, it keeps higher wages, but it puts a lid on inflation. The big worry with the Fed is we haven't had the we have a transitory, transitory. Haven't had the best record when it comes to um, inflation, right? So if they start cutting and inflation just comes roaring back, that's not going to look good for the Fed or, or even in an election year or whatever. It's not going to look good, right? But with productivity doing what it's doing, with all the massive um, infrastructure that we've been creating, uh, constructions up 12 months in a row, uh, manufacturing structures, I'll just show it very quickly. It's this one. Boom. That's a boom. That's going that's up, okay? Recession. We are, we are making things. That's the CHIPS Act, right? Bringing onshoring back and certain things. Productivity to us. Looks a lot like the mid to late 90s and a higher productivity. We haven't seen anything like that since the mid to late 90s. Really, really powerful. This is the last one. Uh, not all cuts are the same. We will see a rate cut this year. We, we feel pretty comfortable there, especially when we look at inflation coming back. And I just look at different cuts. We would argue this is a normalizing cut, right? The mid-80s, the late 80s, uh, 2009. And you can see the numbers are the numbers. What is it there? Normal A year later, up uh, three out of three times. Small sample size, sure. But 13% is when they're cutting before a recession. And I get it. I could come on in four months and say, I guess they were cutting because of a recession. We just don't see the major signs of a recession right now. And check out panic cuts, like after 87 and then uh, the Asian contagion. And then, of course, uh, the pandemic up 17% a year later. It's showing, once again, maybe buying panic is kind of how you should look at the world. But just, just be aware when this first cut comes, and we still think there's a better chance, maybe coin flip, it'll still be May. We've got two more CPIs, two more PCEs. Uh, we think that shelter component is going to kind of come back to Earth. So maybe we do get that first cut in May, and it'd be more of a normalizing cut, which is not by itself a reason to panic. All right, guys, I'll take a break. I could have called. I could have talked to that for an hour. Get a drink um, of water. Hopefully, hopefully not everyone's well, asleep. What do you first think? First of all, Ryan, we got a great comment. Um, someone asked if you considered being a rapper. Um, <laughs> no, but I do have a face for radio, so I'll just stick with podcasts. I don't know. <laughs> okay, Dennis, go. Ahead. I know you always have a great, great, 
Go ahead, Dennis. Uh, take it away. There's so much information here. I mean, you could probably digest this over the course of the next two hours. Yeah. No. Um, I'm trying to like sum it up here. Could be a little seasonal weakness mm-hmm. here, but Statman saying we're going higher here by the end of the year. So if you know you get a little seasonal weakness, I think you see that probably as a buying opportunity then. Ryan? Yeah, we we absolutely do. We're over at equity, so I don't know in the m- money that we run for our partners. I don't know if we have that much more to really add on any weakness, but we're still overweight. Um, I think the bottom line is we wouldn't be panicking. I mean, remember last March, not eight percent correction, regional bank crisis. What happened? I think I came on with you guys and talked about this. Everybody was turning bearish. We actually yeah. added some equity risk in late March because we looked at the credit markets, we looked Great at credit call. spreads. Credit spreads weren't freaking out. I mean, it's as simple as that, and they're still not right. So we're gonna have we're gonna have a five percent pullback at some point during this year. We might even have a ten percent correction because it tends to happen, especially in an election year. Mm. Just be aware that this is the way these things work. And after the run we've had, what do we just have? Uh, S and P up fourteen out of fifteen weeks and gained twenty percent those fifteen weeks in the history of the S&P 500 that has never happened before. I mean, we just had one of the most exquisite rallies, wow. consistent rallies we've ever seen. And I took a look at when you gain 20% after 15 any 15 week period, very small sample size, yes, but again, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but 6 and 12 months later, very very bullish. That blast of strength we had tends to resolve higher and if the economy stays strong like we think it will here. There's still a lot of reasons. Why is everyone so unhappy? Why why is everyone so unhappy about the economy and everything that's going on and everything's t- that's all are under invested. They're yeah. unhappy because they're underinvested. And everything how that's how bad is. things are and everything. I mean what, well, what's with that, right? Yeah, no, you're right. I, I think Dennis has a good point there. I think a lot of people are invested. They've sold. Um, you know, I think, yeah. I mean, I hate to be social media, but I think a lot of that, you, if you're not happy in your career, if you're not happy in your relationships and you see certain people, you know, showing that things aren't as bad as it sounds, they hate it. I mean, this time a year ago when we were pointing out at our shop at Carson Group some reasons to think stocks are going to be pretty darn good. I mean, the tweets and the replies on my tweets were just people hated that. And, really? and I do think right. it's, it's just that mentality of, you know, caveman mentality, right? Like you're huddled up in a group and the group said a recession was coming because you know why there's this thing called the yield curve which has this perfect record which isn't even necessarily true nonetheless look over in europe yield curve has not worked in europe all oh, the so, inverted yield yeah curve. yield curve leis and m2 those are the three that if you turn on cnbc any given day i promise you somebody pointed out leis m2 and by the way leis they actually came out and said oh our bad we're gonna change our methodology now i mean we don't even get into that m2 whatever it is what it is um but there are just other factors to us like the hard data i mean manufacturing Manufacturing. manufacturing has been weak-ish, yes. If you look at the surveys, it's been under 50 forever, like just popped above 50, meaning now expansion in these surveys. But the hard data, durable goods and things like that, they've been really strong. It's this wild dichotomy, um, you know, right here, Joel, that is truly unlike anything I've ever seen in the 20, I don't know, 25 years I've been doing this, where people feel one way, but they do another. But honestly, if you've just been bullish and ignoring a lot of the fear and worry, well, obviously it's been a, hadn't been the worst run, I'll tell you that. Ryan Dietrich, Chief Market Strategist at the Carson Group, one of our favorite guests here on Pre-Market Prep. We didn't even have time to talk about Michigan being national champs. We'll see what happens next year, but we'll talk about that next time. Go Blue, Ryan. We all really appreciate you. Well, I can't, I can't say that, but no, guys, I'm, I'm honored. I'm honored uh-huh. you had me back. And um, it's springtime. Get a little warmer. Maybe we get a little spring pullback. We'd be all right, and I'll come back next month. We'll talk about it. So thanks for having awesome. me back, guys. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ryan. All right, guys, Ryan Dietrich from Carson Group. Again, thank you to Ryan for bringing all those great stats and trends to the show. Uh, wow. Some other earnings we had uh, this morning, actually, Baidu reported. Uh, yeah. Dennis, Ooh. I know you I know you were in the, the uh, China trade real quick. Let me go yeah. ahead and get those numbers on Baidu. Looks like we're leaking a little bit pre-market. Uh, EPS came in at 308, beats $2.48 estimate. Sales Hold came up. in at 4 billion and uh, 4.92 billion versus 4.86 billion. So double beat there, and yet you're still seeing the stock trading slightly lower this morning. Yeah, they hate China, and China is down significantly here today. So they couldn't have reported on a worse day. FXI is trading down 2.34%. I'm not sure what the overnight news was. In- in China. Bob is down over 2%. So this is reporting into a tough market when you get probably the weakest day we've had from China stocks in a month. So they reported into a bad day. Um, I was double long it going in. I sold half of it ahead of the report. Nice. Um, yep. The other half I held through because I had part of it in, you know, for designated for a longer term trade. Um, holding that still, you know, like 
it, it's tough when you're buying laggards they don't just take off and go straight up you know like the laggard trade is choppy and messy and you're just hoping eventually the value does prevail here i mean the stock makes a hell of a lot of money if you believe the numbers i do believe they're going to be a leader in ai over in china um i i'm still long it I obviously disappointed it's not up on these pretty good report uh let's see if the buy if they want to defend this stock you had a nice move from 97 and a half up to the high of the move yesterday you're back a buck uh a buck and a half off that so i mean the longer it takes to peel back halfway here to the 105 106 area i mean it did it did show you know it came off the low people may feel that they missed the move they want to have it long term this is not much of a dip here so let's see Let's see how, if it refuses to get back half of this move over the next couple of days. I think there's underneath demand for this stock, and we'll see if it can uh, make a turn, get back above the high of the move. Street kind of going the wrong way. I don't know what the streets are in Japan. It's not or China. It's not Wall Street, but uh, that mark one twelve thirty six. That's uh, the closing high for the move. That's not too far away. Yeah, well, it's not a lot of dip here, but we did get a big dip in another stock that reported earnings. If you bought this stock ahead of earnings, you might need some of its product. That's uh, Sam Adams, ticker SAM, oh. the Boston Beer Company. Uh, I mean, this chart. Yeah. I mean, look, look at that chart on the bottom right. That's not. Well, that's ugly. Well, well yeah, I mean, and again, craft breweries have eaten Sam's lunch. I mean, there's so many little micro breweries coming around competition from everywhere in this industry i know bud has held up better um longer term but even budweiser 2016 was 130 dollars is 62 dollars tap is a similar story 120 dollars back in 2017 seven years later it's been halved as well i mean all of the traditional you know we had the, like the major beer brewers were the ones that everybody went and got their beer from now everybody tries everything so there's just 10 thousand microbreweries probably more throughout north america competing with the big wow. majors and that has shown up that has shown up in the stock prices because they're all down significant in the last seven or eight years uh tough one here i mean it's consolidated between 300 and 400 forever so maybe if you want to need to own this thing maybe let it get closer to the 300 dollars area uh just beware it's down Forty-two dollars on six hundred and seventy-seven shares. So I don't know. I I'd say it's still in price discovery. Sure. Now. Yeah, we haven't had a lot of trades here, so that's one thing to consider. And you know, maybe there's been a washout. Maybe there's another washout. Maybe it bounces back. It was good. It was lifting again. Look at this. Look at the consistency of my core strategy. One of my core strategies that I've employed for the better part of fifteen years, probably, is owning stocks ahead of reports. If you own stock ahead of the report, Sam, 350 to 370, you can sell it at the close. Just mark it, LOC, limit on close going into the report. That's how you can do it. You know, you buy them three days ahead, sell them LOC, limit on close. Some of them don't work out. Obviously, we're never going to be 100% right. But more often, it seems than not, if you can be on that trade 55% of the time, they go up. You can make some good money with that strategy. You would have made money again owning the stock ahead of the report. Not you taking them say. through, though. And real, yeah. qu real quick, this is from uh, Chris Camillo over at Dumb Money. He he uh, was looking at the dry January Google search terms and was saying that this was the biggest dry January ever. And I guess shorted it because I mean the January was in that last okay, quarter's call, report man. and it worked. I don't know exactly if that's you know part of the reason that the stock went down, but just again, interesting uh, take there from Chris over at Dumb Money. We've had Chris on the show lots of times, and I, we know the Dumb Money people well over there, and they do a great job. He does the social herb where he's looking at you know social trends and trying to get ahead of it. I know he had the Mattel trade last year. You know, there's not a lot of traders that I follow actively out there um but chris is one of them you know t3 is great too we have t3 on those guys are all good too and chris camille over at dumb money just does a fantastic job he's the main reason i've been buying tesla i mean i've been talking you know he's talking yeah. to humanoids and he's all in there and i think he's got a point i think the humanoid i like i'm watching the videos on these things and they're pretty cool it's got the little egg and it can move it like this i mean yeah. he he believes that there is going to be you know within 10 years and by 2040 that everybody's going to be you know using humanoids to do the basic household functions in their house washing the dishes doing that he thinks they might lease them maybe they own them 
you know, anywhere from fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. One of these things is going to cost you. So the kind of the cost of a car. Lots of companies working on them. So obviously, it's not just Tesla. I always thought dishwashers were useless. I always thought <laughs> I want to short dishwashers, but uh, well, Dennis, what about the robotic dishwasher that actually goes and scrubs and does it and puts it away? That's in it. I think they're good for this. I'll, I'll buy one of those. I'll tell you right now. If you've got the humanoid okay. that's going to come in, clean the whole bloody house for me for forty thousand dollars, you know, down like just buy one for forty thousand bucks. You know, maybe you got to charge it. Maybe there's going to be some, you know, mechanical costs and upkeep. I'll buy one, man. Go mow the lawn, humanoid. Go do this, humanoid. You know, we'll charge you. We'll give you some good charging okay. tonight. You know, if you go. All do right, that humanoids. Okay. I'm All a, right. I, I, honestly, I'm with them, man. I'm okay. with them on the humanoids. I wish. Boston Dynamics was public. I can't bring myself to go buy Hyundai because you got all the debt in Hyundai. And it's, you know, and again, Tesla, you know, is debt free, which is a nice thing. So they got a lot of money to work on this. There's going to be other companies that do it too. But I think you're seeing the life and the perk up in Tesla. I think is a lot of this humanoid talk. The one problem with is up against the, the, the clock Tesla here, Dennis, is not Dennis doing wrap great. it up. What do you got? Final thought for the day here. We're up against the clock. Holy, nine o'clock. Okay. Um, Final thoughts, just we're getting a little bit of a pullback. I think we're going to have a pause in the mega caps. I think we're cooling off a cool off period. So not chasing any mega caps here. I don't like the fact that you're starting to see short squeezes and stuff that usually ind indicates a short-term market top. So if I was in anything for trades right now, in big tech, I'd probably be taking profits. All right, Joel, who do we got coming on the show with us tomorrow morning? Mark Chaikin. Mark oh. Chaikin of Chaikin Analytics. He'll be joining us. Final thoughts on the S&P. We're trying to get back above mid-range here, and that's where we've stopped so far. So mid-range, work our way back towards on close. Uh, that, the current pre-market low, that's a huge level. We'll make that a four-star. You know why? Because that is the weekly pivot. So Bulls still in control for the week. Everyone, thanks for joining us. Great show. Thanks to Ryan uh, Dietrich of the Carson Group. Yep, we will have live trading starting up right now. Do not go anywhere. We, we will redirect you. Some earnings coming this afternoon. We got Salesforce, HP, and Mara. Happy trading, guys. We'll be back tomorrow morning.